freaking first cut. Golly. What's going on, YouTube? 18 holes to go and a heavyweight bout between Rory and Victor is shaping up at the Open Championship. We're going to break it all down and look forward to the final round. Hit the like button. Make sure you're subscribed. We'll get started right now. Welcome to the First Cup Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman. That right there, Greg Dusharp. And Greg, uh, you cannot convince me that was a Saturday. I'm positive that was a Sunday, a major championship Sunday. Are, are you okay? Do no. we, we need do we need help here? Are you hanging in there? This is the first time I've been like I had to crawl up from the ground to to get into this chair to record this podcast. Yeah, this was uh, it was something else. Quite a day, and you know there were so many players that were in the mix heading into the day, and and I I can't help but feel I'm, as I'm sure you do extremely happy with the two players that we have kind of separating themselves up on top. So it, it's just an incredible leaderboard. And the the action today was fantastic. Jordan Spieth, T11. Dustin Johnson, solo seven. Scotty Scheffler, T5. Cam Smith in the mix. But the two men at the top of the leaderboard, 16 under par and four shots clear of the rest of the field are Rory McIlroy and Victor Hovland. Th this is... I don't know. Like it's going to be special, Greg. Right? We've got the we've got the 150th. It is such a pro Rory crowd. This is the only guy that Victor could take on four shots clear in the final group and not be the fan favorite. It's just so pro Rory. The entire golf world is is urging him to come through and claim victory here. It's been so close. It's been such a sensational year for him. And he everything that he's done off the golf course for the PGA Tour, it carries a ton of weight. And, and it makes people like us root for him even more. You know, and if I, I know Rory was a huge fan favorite before all this stuff, but when you combine what he's done on the golf course and what he's done off the golf course this year, it's hard for that not to level up a little bit. Even if even if you were a big Rory fan beforehand, I mean, it, it has just been cemented now. And I think all of us who are PGA Tour fans uh, really appreciate what he's done. And his game has more than backed it up. And he's been knocking on the door for a long time now. He's going to, with this finish tomorrow, um, I, I don't expect to see another 80 out of Rory tomorrow. Uh, you're going to see, an, uh, for the first time in his career, all four top tens. Uh, and and you might see the first win since 2014. So it's just in so many ways it it feels right for Rory. Um, it's it's really special, especially since 2015. He missed the 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 last Open here when he had a chance to defend, which is a rare thing. There there are just so many reasons to love what Rory has going on right now. It was a Saturday 66 where. Greg, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. I think he pulled driver everywhere, didn't he? Like he was just locked and loaded with the big dog. Yeah, he had uh, what he had. I think he had three wood on 18. Okay, that's because um, that's his driver's too much there. <laughs> that's right, exactly, exactly. So uh, it was still the it was the right play, but he yeah he let loose, and that's when Rory's playing really free. And you know, it's one thing that I thought coming into the week could be really beneficial for Rory is. The left side is open. It's okay yeah. if you miss left. That's right. Not that he really has. I mean, he's not he hasn't really missed anywhere, but uh, but it's just been I, I think it frees him up and I think it allows him to to you know freewheel it. And when Rory freewheels it, there are a few better. And so uh, you know, a 66 today with just one bogey at the road hole, it it looks pretty it looks pretty free. You combine wow. a short game and his putting. I mean, it's just his game is so well rounded right now, and that's what it takes to win major championships. Yeah, his pace on the greens was great. He went out in 33, and then the highlight from Saturday's third round was holing out from a bunker on 10, Greg. And you could see Rory had that look like, uh, I, I want to celebrate this more. I know I've got to stay composed, but man, I am feeling it right now. <laughs> yes. And hey, it's so funny because 33 going out in 33 almost feels like a letdown. It still felt like a slow start in a way. It, it didn't feel like Rory was here comes Rory because, you know, the guys in the morning were tearing up the front nine. Uh, it was it, it was really um, something special. So 33 it felt almost average. And then he drives it in the bunker, gets the good lie, doesn't get up against the lip. Right. He's in the fat of the bunker and it's still a hard shot. And you're, and you know, with the tee shot Victor hit, you knew he was going to make three. 
Um, so it, it, it felt really important and it goes in and the place erupts, which was, it was just so cool. But those are the kind of moments that, uh, that sometimes you need, you need it to go in instead of ended up just on the edge. That can be the type of thing that spurs him on, but was also really cool as he was able to play really smart after that. I mean, he didn't force the issue. He, he did stay composed and he yes. made the right decisions after, which was important. Yeah, the only blemish on the card was 17, the road hole, which was playing devilish all day long. They had the stat up there. Only 7% of the guys in the field hit the green in regulation. And Rory was, uh, he was between the wall and the road, Greg, which is, it, that's a crapshoot. When you fly the green, you don't know what you're going to get. He could have been up against the wall and had to pull off the Miguel Angel Jimenez shot, or he could have stuck on the road. Luckily, he had... A decent swing. He was able to get it on the green. He would two putt for bogey, but that could have been a real disaster. Yes, and you think I guess that is one of his, one of the left misses off the tee, uh, which is understandable without a bounce right. But then you, you end up with these wispy lies, and you don't know how they're going to come out. And it's cool at the Open. Some you don't see it so much at St Andrews because it's not overly long. But you know, some of the past Opens in history where you have some longer par fours, I mean, you see guys hitting like eight iron from. 220 yards out of the these wispy lies because they, they're jumpers but you don't know for sure if it's going to jump so the the error is long there, there and he, if you know if you're in between clubs and he ends up catching the flyer and it, it gets all the way back there but you're absolutely right the the way that it bounced was definitely some good fortune and it, even if it led to a five it was it was a really good break yeah the hole was playing 4.6 today so he didn't he only lost less than a half a stroke to the field by making by making bogey that right. very 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 difficult hole um so much anticipation in regards for Rory McIlroy potentially winning a major championship and and snapping this eight year stretch you talked about it already Greg you know top tens at, at each of the first three majors um unless we get an absolute collapse he is going to add a fourth to that on Sunday and they had this stat up on the on the telecast, the longest wait between open victories. Well, Ernie Els waited 10 years, Gary Player 9, Jack Nicholas 8, Rory McIlroy currently in an eight-year stretch, but that's also Rory's major drought in total, right? It's not just open victories, it's it's major championships in general. Um, right. Well, one major remove because he won the 2014 right. PGA, which was in August. At, at that, that time, time, it was after, right. Which, by the way, speaking of that, I don't know if you remember this, but I, I think it was on... It might have been on Sunday. You know what? That might be just a bad take. But Rory hit this this uh, on ten at Valhalla. He hit a three wood that was he he necked it, and it was this like ugly low cut that rolled up there to ten feet, and he made the eagle putt, and it spurred him on. Mm. I can't remember if that was Saturday or Sunday, um, but it it kind of you know the break at ten, getting in the middle of the bunker and making it kind of reminded me of that. But again, these these are the magical moments that you need to win majors. And that's the one major that Rory was really close in, in that 2014 PGA, his last major. And um, the other ones were kind of runaways. So this one feels like you need a little bit of that magic. It felt like we got it today. And I, I hope it didn't, um, I hope it didn't burn out because I, I think this one just feels right. And, and, and it feels like this drought feels different than all those two. Because it, it doesn't feel like this is one last one for Rory. It feels like this, you know, winning here could spur him on to a maybe a career Grand Slam in April or a couple more majors. He's, he's so young still. It's amazing that he has four majors, has an eight year drought, and, you know, has still so much great golf left in front of him. I am heavily emotionally invested in Victor Hovland winning the 2022 open championship. But if I can step outside my body for a second, like the Rory McElroy winning this event right now after this year and just everything, I, I could cry, Greg. I could cry if Rory wins tomorrow. Uh, it, it's a, uh, it's extremely emotional and it's here. It's special. It's it, it does almost bring you to tears. And I, I, I think it's, It'd be great for Victor and nobody would be upset if Victor won. Nobody would be upset if Cam Young or Cam Smith won the open championship, but um, uh, it's best for the game. If Rory wins, it would almost make it feel rigged. 
<laughs> right? It's like it's too good to be true. Rory McIlroy <laughs> wins the most historic major ever. When all of a sudden, you know, you're talking about 150 years. It it, it highlights in so many ways what the PGA Tour, the game that we enjoy now and have been for so many years, what what that embodies versus what they're up against now. And it would just be uh, uh, the crowning moment of the year without question. Uh, Joe Musso has already set the line for whether I cry or not as the favorite minus 105. You should hammer that side. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a couple. There's multiple paths to victory for 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 tears coming down the face. Uh, Victor Hovland matched Rory McIlroy's uh, Saturday 66 with a 66 of his own. And uh, Greg, he started applying pressure immediately out of the gate. He birdied four in a row, three, four, five, and six, made a couple of long putts in there, made the turn in 32, and then added two more on his second nine. Uh, a lot of impressive play, but I was really impressed with the putter. Uh, not only he was able to hold a couple of long ones, but even when he left himself with five or six feet for par after running a birdie putt by, he was stout and he was strong and he rolled them all in. Yeah, you know, he's been putting really well this year. Um, and I think he's, I have, I have it right here in front of me. He's 29th on the PGA tour and strokes game putting. Um, but in the areas that we talked about early in the week as being really important, he kind of struggles. He's, he's 165th and three putt avoidance. He's 169th in approach putt performance. And that's kind of, we talked about it with, uh, with Wyndham Clark as well, how He's a great putter, but those areas aren't strong. And, and that tends to come with aggressive nature. And Victor has that aggressive nature. So the five footers coming back become just extremely important. Uh, but, you know, Rick, he hasn't really been playing that great coming in. This is um, like, like a little bit of newfound form. He hasn't been his usual self with the ball striking. Not that it's been bad. It's just been a little, you know, lackluster. Uh, he lost four and a half shots putting at the at the Scottish Open in a missed cut there. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that's uh, a little reminiscent of what Colin Morikawa did last year. These young players getting some links experience and, you know, it takes a it takes a week to get used to it, I guess. But it, this was a really impressive round. And the shot that stood out to me was probably um, the up and down at 17 at yeah. the road. hole. that was special from the rocks. Yeah, Greg. you can you yeah. can get you can get uh you can be in the grass you can be in the rocks you can be on the road or you could be up against the wall. There's a lot of bad things if you're over the green at 17. Yeah, and there's a lot of bad things if you're short of the green too. <laughs> That's it's true. Just not it's just not easy. Right? <laughs> there's it, just a lot of bad things in general on that hole. Yeah, it's a hard, it's a really hard hole. Um, so but it, that was that was a huge four for him. I I think it's so interesting. So, so Victor Hovland, four shots clear of everybody else at, at an open championship. And the guy that he's got to battle the first time ever inside the top 10, uh, heading into the final round of a major championship is Rory freaking McElroy, right? Yeah. Like this is going to be, it's going to be a tough draw. Yeah. Well, Hey, if you want to be the best, you got to beat the best. Oh. And that would be the attitude heading into tomorrow. If you're a victor, you're not say, of course it has to be Rory. You know, you want this to be a, a memorable experience. You want to feel that pressure and you want to be able to say, Hey, I, I won the open championship and I, I took down Rory McElroy down the stretch. You know, there's a, there's a, a new trend on the PGA tour where I, I don't think players are intimidated by their opponent anymore, the way they were with tiger. And right. that could be because there's no tiger anymore. Uh, but I think they also ad adopt the attitude that hey, this is this is an opportunity to um, to take down a, a legend of the game rather than, oh, boy, uh, I'm playing with Rory. What am I going to do? He's right. going to he's going to hammer me. I, it feels like they've they being the young players across the board have really evolved and uh, and improved in that area. I think one of the things that most people get wrong about Victor because he's got like a resting smile on his face is that it's like, oh, he's just happy to be here. I can assure you he is not just happy to be here. You know, he he said it himself in his in his post round um, comments. It felt like match play. I know he's going to bring his best stuff tomorrow. I'm going to bring my best stuff tomorrow. The, he Victor Hovland might not win this open championship, but there is not a scenario in which he blinks playing with anybody. No, he's he's fully confident in his own game, and he yes. should be. And he you should can see be. that in the in his uh, in his style, right? He is extremely aggressive, and you you might say a major championship like this being overly aggressive can be a problem. Uh, and I've said that about Victor. I said it about him at the Masters this year. I thought that 
um, sometimes majors require more conservative strategies than Victor shows. But um, when you're good, you're good. The aggressive play can pay off. You just have to hit the shot, and he's not afraid to execute it. So he's he's a, a really a joy to watch. I, I tweeted this out, but I am I, I am going to be so gutted, Greg, for one of these guys, right? If yeah, there's not two Glatt Claret jugs tomorrow. There's one. And I'm going to feel sick for either Victor or, or Rory. I, uh, a lot of the responses were kind of like, well, this is, this one feels like Rory's Victor is going to be in a lot of major championships moving forward, which I completely understand, but major championship contention is never guaranteed, right? How no. many times have we seen that over the years when it's like, oh, he's young, he's going to be in a lot of these and he never gets back into that spot. Like you don't get to take these for granted. No, I mean, just look at R Rory McIlroy, right? Where we're calling right now, or I did anyway, a legend of the game. Uh, and, and it's been eight years since he's won one. And he's what, what is, how old is Roy? 32, yeah, 31 or 32. So, so it, you know, there's no, you can't run the total ahead of time. You can't play the futures here. I mean, look at what happened to Jordan Spieth. He lost his, he lost his game for two years. And and it, it still, in a way, feels like he's, you know, coming back. Um, and, and so you can't take it for granted at any point because there is just no guarantee in this game. And you'd like to think that he's going to contend many, many more times. And I'm sure he will. But uh, you definitely can't take that approach heading into tomorrow. Uh, Roy turned 33 in May. So 33. There, there you go. Even older than we thought he was. I mean, would, would you expect him to be 33 <laughs> years old, have four majors and have an eight year drought? No, right. right. Have four majors when you're 25 and then have four majors when you're 33. Like, right. <laughs> and be player of the year and set scoring averages and still like, he's still the best player in the post tiger era. Uh, Oof, and, yeah. and he has an eight year major drought. It It's not, I mean, and if you're Victor Hovland, you got to take something from that because it's, uh, it's, it's not, it, it's not guaranteed. It is not guaranteed. Um, despite us turning this into a two man race, there are, there are other guys in the mix and we've seen some kind of crazy things happen over the years. So we'll talk about the chase pack. Uh, we'll look at the live odds. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. And we're back. Uh, okay, Greg. So as we know, thanks to, uh, where's that stat, Jacob, about Justin Ray? You've got to be within a couple of shots. Did we Did we lose yeah, that? Four. Oh, no, here it is. It's here four. It is. Yeah. So Justin Ray, 22. Thank you. Uh, 22 editions of the Open have been played at St. Andrews as 72-hole tournaments. That goes back to 1895. That's pretty long ago. The winner, every single time, has been within four shots of the lead entering the final round. So that gives us Victor, it gives us Rory, and it gives us two cams who are four shots back. Let's start with Smith, who was our 36-hole leader here, Greg, and it was a little bit disappointing. Uh, one over par, 73, that flat stick that had been um, special for the first two days of this event, kind of let him down. Then he made a, a, a sloppy a double at 13 where he tried to hit the hero shot with the ball on his waist. And yeah, oh, there it is, Jacob. Oh, Jacob's got, if you're watching on YouTube, Jacob has the screenshot of the baseball swing Cam Smith tried to take out of a pop bunker on 13. Uh, th this was not a good day for Cam. No, this this one here was a really... A, a, just a terrible decision. What do you What do you do here, Greg? Do you just you just punch it back out in the fairway? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you you got to understand. Look at how close the shaft is. If you're watching on YouTube, the shaft right below the grip is like what a foot and a half above the lip of the bunker. I mean, this isn't like a. There are some baseball swings where you're on the side of a hill mm -hmm. and it's a steep hill, and so when that happens, you can kind of stand back a little bit and. You still get the the sole of the club has the chance to make impact squarely or somewhat squarely, uh, and you got to decide where it's going to go, what direction it's going to go in. But this is all of a sudden the club is like three feet too long for you, and just the heel of the club is in the ground, right. and you, you're not going to make a you're not going to make solid contact on it. So I really don't understand the thought process. I, I I mean, Azinger said on the broadcast, you're not practicing that shot. So what you do is you punch it out in the fairway. You maybe you put it back into play. The rough around there is so light. You put it 12 feet 
and you can knock it on the green with a wedge. I mean, it's, it's really quite simple, but um, you have those mounds directly in front of you, which is the one place you can't hit it. And you're now right. bringing those directly into play. I mean, you're just asking for it. So that was a, it was a terrible decision. Absolutely. Tre- I mean, just terrible. Do you, and I imagine that is a moment because by the time he had gotten to 13, he was even par. Uh, the boys had passed him already and he's probably trying to make something special happen, right? It's, it's, if he starts out, if he goes out in three under, he doesn't even try to pull this off. No, I, I um, would say it's very likely that he wouldn't. And, but you still, you have to play the right shot at the right time. And that, that is very challenging in majors. Um, that, that's why number 12 at Augusta has given so many players such a hard time because it's, you know, it's early enough in the round, but you're asked the question, do I, do I put the tournament on the line here right mm-hmm. now? Mm-hmm. And, and this is not the time to roll the dice. Maybe if this was Sunday, if this was Sunday, I, I don't think I'd, I'd rip him for it. Not that I'm trying to rip him. I just, I wouldn't rip the decision. Uh, if, if this was Sunday, but uh, being on Saturday, you got to live to see another day and you can't make, you can't make six. Uh, even if you get it over the mounds, look, where, where are you expecting to hit that ball? I, I would love to know what was going through the mind of he and his caddy there. Cause it's just the wrong play. And, and I'm sure he knew it going in. So yeah, disappointing. And it made tomorrow a lot more difficult for him. The other thing is, and I, I don't always love like questioning strategic choices that golfers make. Sometimes in the heat of the moment, I, they can make mistakes or they've thought about it and, you know, for, for weeks in advance and they're, they're doing this. He's like the only guy who lays up on 18, Cam Smith. He keeps laying up on 18 and uh, yeah. he has not taken advantage of it, right? He's made two pars there, which is, I mean, you're losing strokes to the field, but that, that's the play that he is, he is sold on. Right. Um, which is, again, it goes back to this concept of you make the right play at the right time. You just, you do the right thing regardless of the situation. And so he does it on 18, but doesn't do it there on 13, which is a little peculiar. Hmm. Um, but I understand why he lays back on 18. You're talking about a guy whose biggest weakness is his driver and his biggest strength is his wedges and his putter. And, so you have an opportunity to take your worst club out of your hands. You don't have to, you don't have to hit it. You don't have to risk hitting it out of bounds. So you eliminate the risk and then you, um, and, and then you highlight your strength. And I, so I understand the concept there. Um, is it the right play? Maybe, maybe not, but I, I think there's at least sound reasoning behind it. Uh, the other cam young, Closed the gap in the Battle of the Camps uh, by shooting a one under 72. And Greg, there were a couple of shots that he gave away, right? He made a double on 16. He bogeyed 13. He bogeyed seven. Um, he wasn't very sharp with his approach play. But kind of as we talked about, I guess it was with maybe Mark last night. It's like, I, I don't think Cam Young's particularly going anywhere. You know, he is... Very cool, calm, and collected. He has a great skill set from a lot of courses, and that translates to the old course. So probably unlikely that he wins, barring a lot of help from some other guys. But this is another impressive result for someone who's about to be our Rookie of the Year. Yes, and this very, very nearly cements him to it. There's always the win out there. So if if somebody else goes out and wins, I think he could get nipped if it's, uh, you know, Sahitha Gala or Mito Pereira, but even, even still he's given them a run for their money with these performances and majors. And, and it's a, it's a great experience for him. And, um, and he's developing in his career and he's understanding what it, what it takes to win these tournaments. And uh, I, I look at this player through the course of this year and he's really improved in his iron play. He's improved in his short game, which were the two big areas of weakness. Um, and, and it's really cool to see. And the thing here that I think gives him such a good advantage is his, his distance and his putting are the two strengths. And right. there's there's a lot of that here. <laughs> there's a lot of that. <laughs> I mean, you have to be a good wedge player, but the difference between a a, a great wedge player like a, like Cam Smith is so fun to watch on these things. But um, but still, some of those wedge shots, the best you can do is getting it to you know 15 feet. 
And so you're not really losing that much if, well, Cam Smith hits it to 15 feet and you hit it to 25 feet. You're not, you're not losing that much in a single round. So I, I think those two things really go his way. And if he can, you know, st stay alive tomorrow as long as he can and make some birdies on the front nine and get himself back in the mix and doesn't make that force it, I need to do this now kind of decision Cam Smith made earlier today, then he could be around. I, I mean, four shots is doable out here. It, it's very easy in a major championship to go have the the final group go out and shoot, you know, set, somewhere between 70 and 73. I, I don't think that would be shocking by any means. Uh, there's a lot of pressure in the final group and, and, and there are certainly enough birdies out there for someone like Cam Young to catch them at that rate. So he's, he's still very much in this tournament. Scotty Scheffler's five shots back 11 under par and I have so many thoughts about Scotty. I don't have the stats in front of me, but off the eye test, he has missed every single putt inside of 10 feet. It feels like he has made nothing. And despite that, he's five shots back and looking to probably add another top five to his major resume this year. The guy's um, the guy, even in the weeks, he doesn't have it is posting ridiculous results. Hey, this is why he's number one in the world. Uh, it, you know, it, everybody talked about this meteoric rise winning four times including the masters um and being kind of like an overnight success but this is what he did even before his first win he contended in all the big events if it was a world golf championship or a major championship scotty played his best golf and that's what he does he plays his best golf when the moments get the biggest and i think that's really fun to watch and really cool to see and that, that it, it makes him a, a very 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 worthy world number one um I, rory's going to have something to say about it tomorrow and in the in the coming weeks for sure but um but scotty's worthy of the position and he shows it time and time again and, and we're start we're realizing now that what happened at southern hills was the anomaly not the not something that can happen very often it was it was a complete anomaly even with so the four count the four wins and then he has a T7 at Riviera, which is just amazing. Big time. He, big time. He's got the runner-up at Colonial. He's got the runner-up at Brook in Brookline at the U.S. Open and probably somewhere in the top five or ten or maybe scoots up to like solo third or something like that here at the Open Championship. It, it, it's yeah. going to be... It, when we look back at this resume, we we weigh those wins too much, and we're not going to give enough credit to the runner-up finish at the U.S. Open and stuff like that. But this is special. It is, and and it, again, it's something that he does. It reminds me of something one of my favorite football players when I was growing up by the name of Santana Moss, a wide receiver for the Jets, uh, and he said, "Big time players make big time plays in big time <laughs> games." And that's what Scotty Scheffler does, right? He's a big time player and he, he makes plays. He makes birdies. He makes Eagles. He, he goes and gets it and, and he puts himself in the position when it matters the most. Uh, and I, I've really enjoyed watching that this year. Uh, I've enjoyed watching the art form and the ability and the desire to hit all different kinds of shots. And that's, that's what he, he does. And it's why he excels. Um, so it's, it's really cool, but, the, he brings up something really interesting to me as well. Um, and it, it hasn't shown through quite as much today, but you were look. I was looking at the board yesterday and everybody on the first page was a master's champion <laughs> or a, somebody oh, yeah. with a, you know, a second place in the masters. Mm -hmm. And you look at all, you know, what kind of success Rory's had, mm -hmm. you know, Cam Smith has a couple of top fives there. Uh, you got Siwoo Kim. Hasn't he played pretty well at the Masters? Too? I think he's got a couple of top 15s. I can check that, but yeah. Um, Scotty Scheffler is a champion. Dustin Johnson is a champion. Adam Scott's a champion. Jordan Spieth's a champion. Patrick Cantlay has a third there. It, it's just amazing to me the um, the correlation between these two, especially when they ask for such different shot one asked for really high hit it as high as you can at augusta national and you get it as low as you can at st andrews but there's still that correlation it's so cool siwoo kim's made five straight cuts at the masters he's got three top 25s during that stretch his best finish at t12 in 2021 let's talk about siwoo let's talk about dj they're kind of the lurkers there 
Greg. And uh, Siwoo, every time he pops up on the coverage, he's doing something fun and making a great shot. And then uh, DJ, who gave everybody a scare out of the gate, right? I mean, he birdies two of his first three holes. He goes out in 34, but coughs up a couple on the back and kind of plays himself out of this thing. Yeah, which was uh, a little, you know, if you're a, if you're a Dustin fan, it, it was disappointing. I'm sure it's disappointing for him to make three bogeys on the back nine, um, and, and the one at number four. Uh, that that's just not great. But uh, this has been something that we've seen a lot of out of DJ in the, in the past. It's it's a it, it's just not quite there yet for him. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it ever will be, but it, right now it's really close. It's just not quite there um and hey boy he has so many close calls at the open championship it's just it's been hard for him to turn the page it's been really hard whether it's here or any of the other venues he's had great success but um a lot of near misses i feel yeah i was gonna say i feel like he's got a lot of near misses everywhere a lot of close calls everywhere yeah um there yeah. was a there was a tweet i and i cannot remember who tweeted it, so i apologize but uh could you imagine if the three majors so dj's three majors which i think we would all agree is like six too few right with the career that he's had right uh would have been augusta uh the old course and oakmont right that's where he won his uso like that's like yeah. the holy trinity of of major championship venues right um yeah arguably the best us open venue and i i think everybody agrees that st andrews is the open championship venue you want to win the most at <laughs> right uh, and obviously the master speaks for itself so it, it would have been pretty special for him if he was able to do that but um yeah. it, it doesn't look like this is his week now he will need uh some type of miracle for that to happen on sunday uh the guys who won't need a miracle are the guys at the top of the betting board we are going to look at those live odds and we are going to figure out how the final 18 holes is going to go down at the open championship but first we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners and we're back all right greg our friends over at caesars have installed rory mcelroy as the favorite minus 110 essentially a coin flip rory mcelroy versus the rest of the field victor hovland also tied at 16 under par with Rory, plus 175. And then the closest chaser after that, Cam Smith, 11 to 1. Scotty Scheffler, 20 to 1. Cam Young, 25 to 1. There are a lot of people sending me tweets, and I'm in a similar boat, Greg, where we've got a lot of pre tournament Victor Hovland money on the line here. Yeah. And odds ranging anywhere from 40 to 80 to 1. Yet there's Rory McElroy there. So, what if we're holding Victor tickets? Uh, what's our play here? <laughs> uh, I, I think your play if you're holding a Victor ticket, hopefully, you're holding a Rory ticket too. Uh, hopefully, um, pre tournament because I mean, he looked so good coming in, it, it seemed like it, he was the right play, whereas Victor didn't seem like the right play, so it's that's why you're getting the better number on it. But I don't, I'm not sure if Rory and Victor are really bettable at this point so I, I think if you have a if you have a victor ticket right now then you go to cam smith and i probably scotty scheffler i might do a little sprinkle on each of those guys as a hedge but i don't i don't see the winner coming anywhere past cam young when you look at this board i, I don't think it's worth it to throw anything on siwoo or dj or fitzpatrick i i, I wouldn't do that uh, and Scotty might be a little bit of a long shot, but he's world number one. And he's five back. Uh, um, so I, I might give him a little more of a chance, but I, I think you're kind of hedging with a, with a cam and a Scotty at that point. Uh, Jacob says, if you have a Victor ticket, you cash it out. Well, not all of us have that luxury of cashing it, of, of even having a cash out option. Uh, is there a Jacob, is there a matchup? Do they have these matchups out yet for these two against one another? Cause you could get into a situation where, mm. Uh, you take Rory in a matchup over Victor. I don't know what I, I, he might be a bigger favorite than minus one ten, but then you you don't have to worry about Scotty or Cam Smith stealing this uh, because if Rory if Rory beats Victor, he's going to win, uh, and if Victor beats Rory, Victor probably wins the tournament. Uh, and I'm sure you're I'm sure you're getting somewhat similar numbers. Yeah, I don't see the odds. I, but yes, I don't we'll, see me at Caesars. I can uh, search around. See if see if anywhere else on the internet has odds. What do you? I don't think so. You should, don't, don't waste you your don't waste your time doing that, Jacob. It's a fool's errand. There's no other. There's no other place. Um, 
the the guys so the guys further back you mentioned it greg uh cam smith 11 to 1 scotty scheffler 20 to 1 cam young 25 to 1 then it drops to 50 i mean this thing is this thing is going to be won by somebody who 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 like like this is not gonna there's no scenario in which victor rory I, I or I think one of the cams win. I, I think you're giving a lot of credit to Scotty Scheffler, but I understand because he's the number one player in the world. Yeah, that's the only reason, <laughs> right? I mean, it, it doesn't feel like you're gonna. And, and here's the other thing: if you're a cam, you got to pass four guys, right? That's you got to pass four guys, and it's it's doable. You go out there and shoot seven. I think 65 is out there today, uh, tomorrow. You go shoot 65. You get a little bit of help. You could find yourself right there. Um, so, and I think he could shoot 63 tomorrow, It'd be an all time round. But I, I think that kind of number could be out there with what well, we're going to get limited wins again. It's not going to be a crazy, brutal day. And you're relying now on the pressure of the guys in the last two groups to not make birdies the way they've been making birdies all week. It's not like they need to have a, a disaster or a meltdown. It's just, it's got to be a little slow for them. And I think that's a real possibility. Um, but I think you're ultimately, you're probably right, Rick. It's coming from the top four. When we get together 24 hours from now, who is the champion golfer of the year? We're crying about Rory McIlroy. <sighs> Man. Yeah. Yeah. We're crying sweet tears of joy. Uh, and a little bit of, a little bit of sorrow for Victor as well. That's, it just feels like it's destiny. Um, it feels like it's meant to be. It kind of felt like that all week. And after today, it feels like that even more. I, I it's so, I mean, he's been so good. He's been I so know. good for so long. Uh, I, my, my head agrees with you. My heart does not. My head, my head agrees with you. I, we can agree on this. The Netflix doc is going to be lit. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, you can't, it, it's like, it's almost like all this was planned. It's like it, this it's is the year. Netflix scripted all of this. I guarantee it. This is not They're running the world. Yeah, this is a scripted show. It's not a documentary. It's not <laughs> reality television. It's a scripted show and the writers are knocking our socks off. Yeah, they're doing a great job. It's uh it's definitely going to win an Emmy or whatever that award <laughs> is. Uh for shows, not documentaries, for shows. So I it's uh if it was written, it would be unbelievable. This whole year would be unbelievable. If this was, if this was, if they made a scripted show about this, I'd be like, too unrealistic. No way Rory gets, like, no way Rory would win the Open Championship. No way. We wouldn't believe it. No, it's, you're right. It's almost too good to be true. Um, but I really, I, he feels different. I, I just think the writing is on the wall. <laughs> Did you see Shane Lowry went back to back hole out Eagles? <laughs> yes. <laughs> on on nine and ten, the guy like, could you? I okay. I I do not chip in as much as I think I should for uh, how much I play golf. Like I never get lucky. I never chip in. I never really hole out. Could you? Im I couldn't even imagine uh, hole in one on nine and then doing it immediately again on ten on Saturday at the Open Championship. Yeah, it, it it's one of the amazing things about the professional golfers is they hole, they hole out. Like they may, they chip they in, yeah. they do it in practice all the time. I mean, just to give you an idea, I'll tell one quick story. I know we got to get going here, but um, I was out at medalist a couple of years ago and Ollie Snyder Jans, you remember him? Oh, I do. Tech? No, no hat. Uh, no and, hat. He, and he was, he okay. So when he first got on the tour, he was like the DFS darling, Greg. It was like yeah. six, 6,700 bucks. Ollie Schneider Jans, he's the man. Here we go. Yeah, right. I think he was a national champion or something. He he was a great player at Georgia Tech. And Georgia Tech came out and they, they came out to play one day. And Ollie was there. And of course, I knew who he was um cuz he was a superstar and he's he's in one spot on the short game area probably 20 yards from the green and there's four flags it's a wide shallow green there's four flags he's in the front right corner and he chips a couple of shots to each flag but he he doesn't go to the next one until he holes it so, oh my so, god right? i I'd, I'd be there for weeks right but but he's not he's doing that as a warm up before <laughs> he's got a tee time and he does that so you got one that's all the way across the green and he makes that one. And then he goes to the next one and 
It, I mean, it took probably a half hour. You know, it, it, a short sided one from a tight lot. It's just, and and he didn't. He barely made it. He's not a superstar. He's not one of the best players. Not one of the best short games of all time. He, but they all they make shot. They hole out. They chip in. They do it in practice all the time. Well, you know what they say, Greg. These guys are good. Yes. Or so I've heard. Okay. Well, 24 hours from now, we will have an open champion. Uh, and it is likely to be spectacular. And if one of the two at the top doesn't win, it's going to be pretty historic. And it's going to be pretty crazy of how it all happens. So something, something special is going to happen on Sunday. And we'll be here after the final putt drops to break it all down. Uh, for now, big thanks to producer Jacob does all the hard work behind the scenes. Greg Ducharme's available on Twitter at the real GFD, and you can find me at Rick Run Good. This has been the first cut. We'll catch you next time.